Graphic design? Can you make a living at that? Three, two, one, fun, 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 Welcome to Design Futures, a show about what happens after design school. I'm Chris St. Cyr, and my guest on this episode is Tara Peralt. It's good to see you. To see you. How are you? I'm good. Let's hear about you. Tara is a product designer at Healthline Media, a division of Red Ventures, where she manages a design system that's used across four separate websites. At the forefront of her design process is the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and designing for accessible web experiences. According to her bio on her website, as a child, she was inspired by the animations of Aladdin, Batman, and Sailor Moon. On her way to receiving a BFA, she completed an associate's degree at Finger Lakes Community College. She is a 2014 graduate of the College of St. Rose. <laughs> How have you been I, since 2014? <laughs> I've been really good. <laughs> Meeting to update my bio, it seems. <laughs> Uh, I've been really good. I've been, I graduated in 2014 and uh, within that year I got a small job at like a print shop in my community and kind of grew from there into moving into advertising at um, a company called Partners Napier in Rochester, New York. And then just kind of blossomed into figuring out what I wanted to do and what kind of avenues I'm most interested in or really want to excel in. So I kind of moved from that print design, like coming from a print shop and then advertising into actually doing product design, which is web experience product design. Cause I know I have, we have some schoolmates that went into product design for packaging. So right. product design for user experience and yeah, for the web. And so, yeah, that, that was one of my questions just to clarify. I mean, I've had other guests that are product designers but so from your experience a product designer a digital yeah. product designer so what what does that entail designing it's a new term it's a it's kind of like the smash between ux and ui designer that instead of just saying ux and ui designer constantly or ux designer that it's a product designer because you're doing the whole gamut of an experience so usually people think of uh, product designers in the experiential realm more as thinking of an app or a set thing that you're managing. So right now I'm managing uh, Healthline Media's site experience. So I manage their, how people interact with our articles, how they interact with our search bar, navigation, all of that, those kind of things to ensure they get the answers they need, mm -hmm. as well as I kind of fell into helping out with our DSM design system management system mm -hmm. is a product for the designers that use it. So I make sure that our buttons are correct, our textiles are correct and all of that so that I can allow other designers and myself to create mocks or create new designs for our like, site mm -hmm. faster and more efficiently. So, so you consider the design system a, a product, in, in sort of an internal product for your team or other teams? I, I would. For me, we have four main sites for Healthline Media. We have other ones, but the ones I manage are healthline.com, greatest.com, medicalnewstoday.com, and psychcentral.com. And having four different sites you basically have to think of all the colors that are used on that site, all the text that are used on the site. And then you think of all the components and then the pages and all of the things. If you didn't have that structured, it gets very confusing and it really kind of gives people a lot of trouble. There's a article template. So having this article not set up in auto layout within our Figma, we have to recreate that article over and over and over again because it's an article site. That's something that I have to go in to actually update to ensure that people can just easily pull that from an assets file, pull it into their file mm. and make sure they're easily able to do whatever they want with it. So the article, the whole article template mm -hmm. is like this huge component and are there other components that go into that component? 
Yes, exactly. So we have, if we think of just that article template, there would be a navigation heading component. There would be in a web banner component, a heading, a byline, uh, paragraphs, images, all of those smaller components that yes, you build right. up to make this huge thing. So that allows for people to, I don't really call that a component. I call it like a page of components, but yeah. Yeah. People call it different things, but a yeah, template, yeah, template right. for to help them all that. But yeah, something even if some one little piece isn't correct on something like that temp on that template, it causes frustration. Yeah, it's a huge thing. <laughs> and and you mentioned Figma. You so you use Figma to manage all of those assets. Yeah. So um, we actually, when I started it on the team, we actually were in Sketch and we're using Envision as well. Uh, about a year ago now, we the team switched over to Figma, switching to a cloud-based server where you could actually interact with people in your file was just so much more helpful. And right now my team is dispersed throughout the country right. that I can see people that are working in North Carolina or San Francisco or New York City without having to hop on a, a red eye to go see them and make sure and for us to discuss that we're actually able to huddle on like a Zoom call like this and work in the file at the same time. As a product designer, can you, and you talked about like these components and this design system and uh, your teams being all over different time zones. Can you uh, talk about like, what is your average day like? Like how, how, what are you, are you on Zoom all day long? Are you in these like design system files? Like what, what's, what's your kind of your day or your average week kind of like? It depends week to week. Sometimes I will say I'm in meetings constantly all day. <laughs> that doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you're just like wondering when I have time to actually do my design work. Yeah. Um, for me, I actually do a lot of more work or a little bit of more relaxing a little bit more in the morning because my day, yes, starts at nine, like nine to five. But most of my team is actually three hours behind me because they're on Western time. So my team is mostly dispersed in like LA and San Francisco area. So they get on at 12, okay. which is 9 a.m. for them. Right. So I, for those three hours, I usually am just trying to make sure everything is ready. I have, I'm getting some of my work done and then it can start with on a Monday is usually our sprint planning meetings. So we go, our team works in two week sprints so that we can make sure we have, we understand what we're working on for that week. It's mm -hmm. more for en our engineers on the team, but I try to help align with that because whatever work I'm working on, probably the sprint before or two sprints before them is probably what they're going to be making mm -hmm. for their sprint. So I have to be either one to two sprints ahead of them to ensure they have work, but also not trying to kill myself, <laughs> trying so fast to get it done for them. Right. So can you explain what a sprint is for those designers and students who don't know what a sprint is? This is bad because I know of it in concept, but <laughs> the full explanation is probably not going to be as bad as, as good as like someone will explain it to you. I'll um, put a link in the show notes of what's what please. the definition of sprint, of sprint is. <laughs> but sprint is, but, but in your usually, experience, what are you doing? But and usually it goes into the agile versus waterfall kind of mentality, very high level working scenarios, but it's the cadence of how you kind of develop your work. It's the idea that you work on something for our, we have two weeks. So they're two weeks sprints where we work at a, a given time. So the two weeks, and then we work on something else and kind of make sure that's done. And then we go to another thing and make sure that's done. So it's kind of like we focus on one thing to make sure it's the best it can be during this sprint, try to get it finished in that amount of time. In the sprint um, process, is it all the team members it's not just design it's like it's like the engineers and uh, and writers and everybody's coming together to make this one thing and you're all very collaborative and you kind of meet more frequently is that is that some of it yeah so i right now our my team is uh consisting of 
a product manager, a, a researcher, a UX researcher, product designer, which is me, and then a project manager <laughs> and multiple different uh, engineers. And we work collaboratively in Slack. Uh, one of my favorite times of the week is actually our Wednesdays where we have our working sessions where our team actually gets to like come together and talk about what we're working on. And some of my favorite times are when I'm working on something and I'm stuck and I can bring it to my engineers and my product manager and my researcher and all of that. And we can discuss and collaborate because I'm in that mindset that everyone can be creative, not just the designer or researcher or anything. Everyone can be, and they have different viewpoints than you do. Or it's really interesting to hear from engineers because sometimes they're like, what are you trying to do to me? That is not possible. Or it's like, that's going to take months of work. And I'm like, okay, what can I do to scale it back? Right. And then we right. think of the idea of an MVP. Like, uh, Which the, is what? <laughs> Don't you, you're using all those acronyms. All the digital designers I talk to, they all use all the acronyms. Your DSM, your MVP, MVP, mo most valuable player. No, I, I know what you're talking about, but you gotta, I'll let you answer it. MVP is what? Minimum viable products. Yeah. You sound like you're right embedded in Silicon Valley there, Tara. Minimum viable <laughs> product. Like, literally no one explained to me what it was and for a long time. And I just accepted it as most valuable player. And I was like, this also makes sense to me. I'm fine with it. In some <laughs> context, it probably could mean the same thing. You wouldn't, it wouldn't even make a difference <laughs> yeah it's it, which literally means that a lot of the times we are putting out something that is enough that you can get by for a test out in the wild so mm -hmm. you usually think of our researcher doing qualitative uh research so they're doing quality research so they're mm -hmm. doing that research with live subjects, usually on usertesting.com, asking them how they feel about something. And then we create this product that it's not, I would say right now I worked on a like safe article thing. And for a user, I wouldn't call it even a profile, a user library is what mm -hmm. we're calling it because it's so, it's just literally where you can see your, wherever you saved your articles, right. just enough that people understand when they it actually is on site, we can get qual quantitative data, which is quantity. We want to know if people are clicking on that save data, if people are actually authenticating to our site. Why don't we take a look at that? So this is Healthline. This is what you're working on now or some version of something like mm -hmm. this. You work on four, but this is just one of them? Yes, this okay. is one of the sites. This is our main site. Right now you're seeing one of our main hubs on our site, uh, the nutrition hub. And these are just, <clears throat> you can see that again, it's a very article based, knowledge based site. Why I was showing this one in particular because that header image, hero image, it was an example that we actually tested and it actually increase people clicking on the article by making the hero smaller we were able to get people to click on images below it having that test actually prove true i had to then go through and look at this for every one of the four sites to ensure that they all worked mm -hmm. and with that then i had to ask all of our stakeholders what how they felt about it because we actually have we have a product team and then we have an editorial design team, which are the people that make these beautiful uh, illustrations that you see for each of the four sites. So we have basically, we're like, yeah, we're changing your dimensions of your hero image. What can we do to help you with this uh, transition? Because we took probably a third of their space away. So they had to go through and redo all of the illustrations or they would have to start from the beginning. So we had all of these conversations with my edit design team of, can we decrease the text size? Can we uh, put character counts on the subheadings? Everything to make it work for them, as well as we had to work with 
the edit team, which are the people who actually write the content. Right. So we have the product designers that make the the product team that makes this that makes the site and the user experience. We have the edit design team that makes the illustrations and sources the photos. Then we have the edit team or editors that do all the text. So you're balancing all these people and it's, it took weeks <laughs> to do something. You think as simple as like, yeah, I'm just gonna change the size of this one hero image. But I think it's interesting to know that is that something that you think is small could be very impactful to many teams across your, across your organization. You have to have buy-in from them. It's interesting to hear how you talk about it as a, as a product at the end of the day, like the visual is very similar to things that I've worked on when I'm, when I'm not teaching, it's very similar to kind of websites that I work on for clients as kind of editorial experiences, but the language is, is a little different. You know, I just come at it from the more of the print editorial and, and most of our clients, they understand sort of language that's from the print editorial side. If I started talking like product design, they, <laughs> they would just like run from the room screaming probably. It's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> oh no, I think that's something that even as like a print designer or a fashion designer or anything like that is something that everyone needs to learn is that you have a different language than yeah. other people. So when you start a new job or anything like that, learning the lingo or learning how to interact is very, is very important. Engineers are going to speak differently than you, than a graphic designer or an editorial designer. They're going to, you're going to speak differently than a product designer it, or businesses has all of the acronyms. You're very afraid to ask what the, what the acronyms mean. So you're like Googling it on the side yeah. and you're like, and you're like most valuable player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But knowing how to communicate is very important. It helps you how to make a good product or make a good design. Because if you're, someone's actually asking you, like, I would say, let's go for a banner ad. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows the banner ad, right? right. Uh, that they're asking you for an MLP or something. They're giving you acronyms and you're just like <laughs> guessing what that is. And you're like, yeah. uh, <laughs> what, what are, what? You need to talk. You just need to ask them what it means because yeah. <laughs> you're going to give them something completely different from what they're asking. And they're just going to look at you like, what just happened? Oh, yeah. So like as embarrassing as it is, just ask. Right. Nobody's going to fault you for that. So let's talk about this one here, which you mentioned. This is part of your boot camp class or what, what's the boot camp and what, what is this project from it? So as I was working at Partners in Napier uh, full time, I actually went into block to do a boot camp part time. It took me like a full year to do things. They didn't let me skip them some things, which annoyed me. They would give you fundamentals of coding, which I needed. So I wasn't ex upset about that, but I was like the fundamentals of graphic design. And I was like, I have a good degree in this. Why can't I skip this? And they're like, you have to do it anyways. I'm like, okay, right. I'll just, and some of the things that they were teaching, I was like, this isn't right. I, I told them that <laughs> they didn't like me as much. Um, my mentor thought it was hilarious, but yeah, the, um, they would give you different projects to go through. They give you a Slack community in case you needed any questions and you would actually also have a mentor mm -hmm. that you could talk with. And then you go through all these steps. So they actually taught you how to do a lot of the processes of user experience design where you would do all this research to figure out uh, who your user persona is, who is actually gonna be using these sites. Do people actually want the site you're coming up with? What's their story? How can people like go through the flow to right. get what they want? And probably if you ever look at my Instagram, I like sweets I, and I love to make sweets. And I was just like one day, I think it was, hot out and I was like I want someone to deliver me ice cream <laughs> <laughs> and that's where this idea came from and then I had to think through this entire thought of well you need to make sure that it's an insulated truck because you don't want melty ice creams uh you want it fast so thinking about that so I did user research based on like insomnia cookies as a competitive analysis as well as like uber eats grubhub what can this offer over them. And I was uh -huh. like, well, this would be an insulated truck versus some dude that has maybe a cooler. 
maybe not in their car <laughs> coming to you. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> maybe not. So I just went through this entire process and just kind of built it all out. And right. for some, and then I was thinking who would actually be using this. And I was getting, it would be probably millennials, Gen Z, because we like ordering. Also the idea of like midnight snacks, hence mm -hmm. why it's kind of a darker blue. So you're mm -hmm. thinking of those kind of th thoughts of you're doing your finals, you're going through all of this and you just want a late night snack. You want a late night ice cream cone. And so this was the, the project for this kind of uh, boot camp that then redirected, slightly redirected your career. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I actually showed the site that you're on to the person, the people who hired me now. Okay. So I guess they thought it was good enough and they thought <laughs> saw my thought process that they took me into a interview where I was there for hours and mm -hmm. they seemed to really like me. Also, mm -hmm. it was extra because I brought cupcakes and for the, I made Red Venture cupcakes for them. All right. Because it was at Red Ventures. <laughs> it was red velvet with red wine uh -huh. with a cookie, like a cookie and cream frosting because their logo is red and black. So that set you off into this, this new area, product design, that where you are now. And that's, you're into it. You're going to be there for a while. Yeah, it was interesting because I think I liked it in in college as well. I yeah. remember uh, having class with you for senior year, my senior year doing yeah. app design. And I made a thing called Blackout. Oh, I think yeah. that's what I called it. Yep. And I really liked it because it was this very organized thing, having all of this organization and making patterns and making everything the same. I think I really like that. And that's kind of why I like it today too, is that yes, it can be confining to some people, but it's almost like the more confined you are for me with the design, the more fun it almost is, is because it's like a puzzle. Right. And it's like the harder the details, the more you want to solve it and more you want to understand it. For the for the business side of this, your your title is product designer. Is there a senior product designer level? Like, what's your path, or what is there some some a title below yours? What's your pathway if you were to stay at this company? What's your growth potential? Okay, uh, yeah. So uh, there is an associate. So I started actually as an associate product designer. Okay. And then I moved into uh, product designer, and then it goes senior designer senior product designer and then it actually splits off which I actually I know some companies do it and I actually prefer it that you could either go the principal product designer way which is a level above senior or you could go into the creative manager tract that tract is like you're getting ready to actually manage people that you're going to get the responsibilities to start giving them reviews right. and all of that so from there you go creative manager, uh, creative director, senior creative director, and then VP. I might be missing right. some, but I think that's pretty much the tract. Right. Is that you could stay over here and just be designing and designing really cool things. Right. Or you could go into that you're the less, like as you go up, the less you are getting to design, but the yeah. more you're managing other people to design and getting them to grow. Have you, have you thought about that, of what you're interested in or? This is a question people ask me the entirety, <laughs> <laughs> the entirety of your. I'm just asking your... if you thought about it, not when no, you made no, a decision. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just saying this is yeah. students should think about. It. It's like, you get asked this every time. Thinking about it now, I don't really have the answer yet. I yeah. think I'm, I still think I want to design and learn so right. that I can be the best manager I can be at the time when I am ready mm -hmm. because that's something I think people don't know and won't know is that having a good manager is really what d dictates your growth because right. they're the ones that fight for you for a promotion. There's the ones that know what you do day to day. There's the ones that are going to help you grow. And if you don't have a good manager or you don't have someone fighting for you, it's less likely that you're going to grow. And I, I just want to be that person that helps people grow and make sure that they're in the right place of where they need to be 
And I think I need to grow into that position to make sure I'm capable of doing that for someone else. It's good to hear. So can you um, talk about where you are right now in terms of salary, like a range of product designer? I live in Western New York, so I can't say anything about living in New York City or San sure. Francisco or anything like that. Our ranges aren't that, <laughs> aren't as extravagant as other people, but sure. usually product designers do make more money than graphic designers They right. in advertising. I think I went, I doubled to maybe tripled my salary oh, right. from going from one company to the next of doing that. Yeah. From moving from advertising or agency to product design. Yeah. Yeah. That's typically what I hear in, in all the kind of surveys that I've read about. Sometimes salary isn't everything. I do tell people sure. that there's three things you want to look for in a job. And they're the more, most important things is pay, the people you work with, their culture, and the work you do. Right. Those are the three things I always tell people. And I'm like, you can always survive on two of the three, like three of the three is amazing, but right. you can survive on two of them. But if you only have one or zero of them, like yeah. it's time to get to a new job. So let's talk about school. You mentioned we did have that class together. I do you remember uh, that about you when we were working on that project? And I still look at yours and I'm like, wow, that's really good for my first time out doing it. I was like, that's a good <laughs> example. I don't think that was me. I think that was Tara. She just really took to it. Were there other things as a student that you, you know, that ended up in your portfolio that you were thinking, like, yeah, maybe I could do this as a career? It's interesting. I think I also like branding. I know I find it interesting because I didn't know what I wanted to do when I left sure. my school. That's understandable. Like, and because there was just so many avenues and things I didn't really still understand, there's things that I found out even after now. And I was like, oh, this is a field now? Like, <laughs> that's interesting. When you think about that time at St. Rose, there's something you feel like we need to really teach this to students coming out of design school or art school. Accessibility. That's something I did not even, it was not on my radar. It wasn't even a thought until I was on the web. Thinking about accessibility, even in terms of just color contrast and colors, uh, probably should be a part of our color theory, right. <laughs> like from a get-go level, because knowing that, oh yeah, if you make your text yellow or orange, maybe 20% of the population are able to read it. I would say that would be my number one thing is to understand what, how people can actually, the accessibility because of how people can actually interact with your and I, brand. So you were at St. Rose, did, is there anything that uh, you did there at St. Rose that was outside of the classroom that, that stands out? Like, did you go on any of those trips or I don't know, oh, take, yeah. a, take a interesting class in the, in the lib ed space or I don't know, was there something else that stands out that not design education related? So because I took a uh, community college, I was pretty much done with most of my okay. uh, live ed classes before I came to St. Rose. So it allowed me to always basically be in Peacot Hall, which was for our um, design classes. But I did take uh, a class because they had like two different classes. But the one I took what, to study abroad was for a week. I got to study abroad in China. Oh, okay. So I got to do that one, which was really cool. I got to draw on the Great Wall of China. Oh, I so. remember students going on that trip. Yeah, you went with that. Yeah, so yeah. That, that's an experience. That's a thing that you don't forget that you're just like, yeah, I got to draw on the Great Wall of China. Not people, many people got to say that. It's really exciting. I liked that. And I really enjoyed all the times that we got to take trips to New York City. We mentioned that you had an associate's degree from a, a community college, which is closer to home. Is that right? Or is it at, at home? Yeah, it was a yeah. half an hour for me. Yeah. Uh, so what was what was uh, life like, you know, before St. Rose, be, you know, like in high school, did you take all the art classes that some kids take or were you interested in other things? Like what, what, was, uh, what was it like before you went to college? So for me, I was always an art kid. Yeah. I did a lot of art classes. I took chorus. I uh, usually was in like accelerated classes, 
because it allowed me to get college credit earlier. <laughs> um, so I did that as well as I did play lacrosse and I was in drama club. So okay. all of that. But my thing I also got to do was we called it the 311 program in high school where you actually took three years of regular high school. Then your senior year, you actually took half day, basically. You took a half day of high school and then you would go to college okay. for half the day. So I, and then one year of college. So out of high school, I actually graduated uh, a year after high school with an associates that landed me still the same year as I was supposed to graduate college if I had just gone to a four-year college. But then I got to have all of the lib ed stuff out of the way. Oh, okay. So did you have any uh, family or friends that are influenced on ter in terms of, uh, the creativity, the chorus, the singing, the art making, any any family, friends, close people? My mom says she's not, but she always did the skits and stuff in our church mm -hmm. when I was a young kid, and I think she still does them now. Other than that, I don't think so, but it's odd because my cousin is somewhat of a graphic designer. Another one of my cousins is a print, a sign designer my, like yeah one of my other cousins is a cook was a chef and like yeah that was that was one of the other things I wanted to ask you about in terms of what, what you do outside of work I know on Instagram there's there's a lot of there's a lot of baking and is that something you do as like a hobby it just it's kind of the question of like what are you doing for your your mental health your just your other kind of things to, to take breaks like so is baking a big part of your life yeah baking is a big part of my life I my family's always like why don't you just go into a bakery and I was like <laughs> no it's my hobby something that I do stress so for that it's kind of the same as anything else I like the people always say to me that baking is hard yeah and I'm like is it because I just do things and then they create and make something like the other day I saw we had lemons and I was like kind of craving making a lemon cake with blueberry filling <laughs> sure who just who does that on a whim <laughs> just Tara. like I was just like yeah let's make that and then I had more lemons left over after I made that cake and made a lemon meringue pie for the first time I was like, why not yeah other than that I for me I just like learning new things or ways to be creative I always think of Paula Cher because she does her offhand hobby of doing all those maps yeah yeah uh, to like relax and not really for money, even though I'm guessing she gets money from them, but who knows? She does now, right? I'm sure she when does she now, started, right? she did, yeah. But when she started, it was just a hobby to right. unwind. And I think that's what I like to do as well as getting to use my hands to make things. Sometimes you're just staring at a screen all day and you're like, I can't, I can't function if I don't do something with my hands. Cause that is probably the one thing I miss the most is the tactileness of uh, graphic design. Right. I love feeling that paper. Even yeah. to this day, I love feeling different papers and all of that, but you don't get to do that. on. So right. now I get to with new experience and learning new yeah. things. So being creative in, in other ways, and but yeah, yeah, doing something off the computer, which I think a lot of designers would feel the same way. I mean, I feel that way every once in a while. It's like, I, okay, I, I just need to make something with my hands. Even though I hate that it does, when they fail, but I'm like, even if it fails, it feels like, oh, I did something different. <laughs> Yeah. Like, yes. Yeah, I think that that's also a good, uh, good thing to think about with the aspect of making things with your hands is you have to maybe embrace failure a little bit more than on the computer. It's easy to undo, right? Command Z and you can fix things pretty easily. And But, uh, you know, when you're working with physical materials and tools, it's like you make a mistake. You're like, well, how am I going to salvage that, right? You got to problem solve and or be okay with the, the mistake and move on. Yeah. Know? Like what? You were, you were thinking some Bob Ross, you're just making happy little, <laughs> never mistakes, little happy trees. Like, yeah. That's what you're doing every time. You're like, you just embrace the insanity. Again, that's probably why I like baking or cooking. It's like, yeah. oh, I made something. This tastes awful. How can I change it so it tastes great? <laughs> All right. It's time to move on to the pop quiz. Ooh. Yeah. Did you study? No. All right. Pop quiz. First question is UX or UI? You can't, you can't yeah, you say to, that. You have to pick one. You can't have 
UI without the UX. That's not true. Well, you can, but it doesn't make it a good experience. You're not doing the pop quiz, quiz correctly. You're already <laughs> failing by not answering the question. UX I, or I, UI? I prefer I prefer visual design, so, so UI. You, UI, okay. But you really can't make the UI without the UX. Sure you can. Oh, you absolutely can. It's all over yeah. Hollywood. Look at UI design in movies. They don't make any sense. They're not very usable at all. They just look cool, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, sketchbook, blank or gridded? Gridded, I guess. <laughs> you said that like a question. I used sketchbook in so long and I'm so sad. That's, that's par for the course for other product designers I talk to. They don't use sketchbooks anymore. Music, do you listen to music while you're working? I do. What are you listening to? If I'm really deep in thought, it's usually lo-fi music. Mm -hmm. It just helps like one side of your brain as you're focusing on the other. But if I'm like in a mood, like recently, I've just been listening to Stranger Things, like the running up the hill or some like oh, yeah. blue some, skies and some 80s, a lot of 80s pop. A lot of 80s pop and some K-pop. And it just <laughs> runs the gamut of whatever pops up on my feet. All right. Uh, favorite pastry to bake? Favorite pastry to bake is cupcakes. It's cupcakes. Favorite pastry to eat? I like cookies. Cookies. cookies more. Uh, how do you back up your files? Figma does it for me. All right, last question in the quiz. If you weren't a designer, what would you be? Probably a baker. Probably a baker. That sounds good. I, based on what I've seen, I think you would do well. Yeah. Do you have any final words of wisdom for the students? Uh, for students, I would say do what you want to do. Don't let other people dictate what you want to do. No one as an adult knows what they're doing. Don't <laughs> let them fool you into thinking they do. <laughs> and we're all just trying to get by and learning day by day. And that's what I think everyone should, ex like you should expect from yourself. Just learn a little more day by day. and try to find new ways of being creative and finding what you do and why you do it in a way that makes you happy. Find joy in what you do. Yeah, agreed. We're all a work in progress. We really are. That's like a big lie. I feel like everyone's like, oh yeah, everyone has their stuff together. And I'm like, doesn't that happen? <laughs> Does it happen? <laughs> it just, people are just better at faking it. <laughs> Well, you didn't fake the interview. You didn't fake this conversation. So uh, I was real. I yeah, was you're real. Like, yeah, just be who you are. People are going to accept your awkward craziness or not. And if they don't, go find someone that will because they some pe people will. Good advice, Tara. Uh, it was great to talk to you. Great to see you and catch up. See ya. Bye. Bye. Wipe those tears from your eyes. Wipe those tears from your eyes. From your eyes. From your eyes. So what do we learn from Tara? Number one, in a new job and a new industry, if people are using acronyms and you don't know what they're talking about, just ask. You'll need that language to collaborate. Number two, bring baked goods to your interview. And if that interview is with me, I got two words for you. Ginger snaps. Thanks to Tara Peralt of Healthline Media. If you have any comments or questions for me or any of the guests, please leave them in the comments and subscribe so you can catch the next episode of Design Futures. Until next time, go learn something. Your future depends on it. Thanks for listening. See ya.